Today, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker because she's one of my own, uh, she, one of our own OSD historians, and her topic is a very fascinating one. I've uh, had a preview, and you're really in for a treat today. But first, a little bit about Rachel Lewandowski. Um, she um, is completing her doctoral work at the University of North Carolina and works for the OSD Historical Office. Her, her um, topic, both for her dissertation and um, her new specialty, really, is on the history of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, as many veterans know, this has a, been a perennial um, issue, continues to be in the news recently. Um, Rachel is going to concentrate on um, a much earlier time period, World War I, um, as part of the World War I Centennial Commission um, and this kind of commemorating the Great War. Um, her topic will focus on World War I, but will um, harken back to the Civil War in a little bit um, in segments as well as the Philippines. Um, but I want you to look for the future, um, her emerging scholarship, because as I said, she really is one of the um, up and coming stars in the military history field. And this is, um, and you'll see, soon see why. So Rachel, without further ado, go ahead and um, get us started. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Mahan, for such a kind introduction. And thank you all so much for joining me. Uh, what is a short week for many of us, since I appreciate you making time in your schedule. Uh, as Dr. Mahan mentioned, this talk uh, comes from my larger study into the social history and the psychological trauma of war. Uh, today, I'll be focusing on the American experience during World War I. Our understanding of psychological trauma of war was developed, debated, revised, and revisited throughout the 20th century. And these discussions continue even now. So I've chosen to focus on World War I in this presentation for a few reasons. First is the 100th anniversary of the war, and as a country, we are reflecting on this period and the experiences of the people who fought a century ago. But from a historical perspective, World War I offers some interesting insights. The war came just as the field of psychiatry was becoming professionalized in the United States. World War I represented the first large-scale attempt at organized military medicine, and the very first time organized military psychiatry was deployed by the United States. <laughs> And finally, it's the first time that medical professionals and the public accepted that psychological trauma caused by war can be just as devastating to a man as any physical wound. So I want to outline a few goals for this talk to keep myself organized. So what did military psychiatry look like before World War I? How did people understand psychological trauma during war? What was shell shock or war neuroses? What did non-medical professionals think of the condition? What did American psychiatry look like during World War I? What lessons did contemporaries take away from World War I? And what lessons can we learn today? Perhaps the most common question I get in my research is, are shell shock and PTSD the same thing? And I have to give the frustrating answer of yes and no. They are the same in that they both represent real illnesses, which are caused by immense suffering for those who are afflicted. But are these terms interchangeable? And I would argue no. The diagnostic label of post-traumatic stress disorder was codified by the American Psychiatric Association in 1980. But the words post-traumatic stress disorder have been debated over the last 20 or 30 or 40 or even 100 years. I would argue that the experience of American military psychiatrists and the mental health profession in each war of the 20th century led to the acceptance of one of these words. Of course, we can talk more about that in the Q&A. And in fact, the last word, disorder, is being debated even today. So words matter when it comes to understanding the history of military medicine. This is especially true when we examine the different ways people talked about psychological breakdown during war. The labels for this breakdown changed during the 20th century because the understanding of mental illness changed. An early example of this can be seen in the Civil War. Understandings of mental illness in the 19th century were incredibly limited. Mental health as a science was barely a science. And in fact, doctors would probably look at it strangely as a science during this time. Psychiatrists had very little by way of actual medical training or psychiatric training, and treatments varied from hospital to hospital. The understandings of mental illness were also incredibly rudimentary. While Americans in the 19th century didn't really believe that people were possessed or touched by demons, they really didn't have an understanding of what caused mental illness. And there's a really great example of this in an 1811 doctoral dissertation in which a gentleman outlines what he thinks could cause mental illness. 
He argued that some of the causes were repeated intoxication, blows or other injuries to the head, fever, particularly when attended with delirium, suppression of periodical or occasional discharges and secretion, great heat of climate, changes of the moon, the influences of the season, particularly summer, in England, the month of November. And he, in the dissertation, outlined the month of November. So pity the people in England this month, I guess. And then striking back to the times, he also argued that national character played an important role in determining whether or not someone would develop a mental illness. And so he argued that people from England, Switzerland, uh, and Spain have the greatest number of lunatics. <laughs> So whereas today the American Psychiatric Association recognizes just shy of 300 discrete mental illnesses, doctors in the 1800s agreed that there was one, insanity. And as the century went along, they recognized a few subcategories, dementia, mania, melancholy, psychosis, and idiocy, but the treatments for these varied very little, and the understanding of the differences between these conditions varied very little. So when the Civil War broke out in 1861, the disarray of the mental health profession was matched by the larger lack of organization in the larger field of military medicine. To be clear, there was no organized military medical psychiatry during the American Civil War. In fact, there was just barely organized military medicine. And much of the mental health care for soldiers fell to general surgeons assigned to various units and divisions. There were no specialists officially deployed with either the Union or the Confederacy. But despite their lack of psychiatric training, Civil War doctors took note of psychological breakdown by the soldiers in their care. They came to call this condition nostalgia. One doctor described it as a peculiar state of mind, a species of melancholy, or a mild type of insanity. And this is a famous image uh, done by Thomas Nast of a homesick soldier longingly thinking about home and his beloved praying for his return. And this image really came to sort of exemplify nostalgia for the public. Symptoms of the condition included loss of appetite, gastrointestinal distress, fever, and what they called indifference to external influences. More serious cases included symptoms such as headache, increased fever, incontinence, anxiety, and a, quote, general wasting of the vital powers. Many doctors believed that this condition could be fatal. There's a poignant description of nostalgia in the history of the 10th Regiment of Vermont, written by the regiment's chaplain after the war in 1870. This was the sad case of Frederick D. Whipple of H Company, who, according to the chaplain, presented himself as sick at sick call one morning with no other complaint than the fact that he just wanted to go home. The chaplain reported that Whipple's con conduct was strange and pitiable, and when the soldier refused to perform his duty on account of his homesickness, he was admitted to the hospital. There, Whipple refused treatment and instead moaned piteously, I want to go home, I just want to go home. The poor fellow reported the chaplain died only a few days later, and the regimental surgeon declared it as a clear case of nostalgia. Psych psychiatrists, however, paid little attention to the condition. It was battlefield surgeons who studied it most intently. One surgeon theorized that only young soldiers developed nostalgia because they had a closer connection to home. He also felt this was especially true of men from the East Coast, not as much men from the Midwest. He also proclaimed that cavalrymen were unlikely to get to nostalgia because one of their love of sports and also their deep affection for their horses. Another sergeant argued differently. He thought nostalgia was caused by dissatisfaction, low morale, and perhaps even an overall lack of manliness. To this end, he offered some possible cures for nostalgic soldiers. He suggested that soldiers have more access to furlough passes, with the idea being that a homesick soldier can't be homesick if he's home. But he called upon military doctors to exert, quote, any influence that will tend to render the patient more manly. He prescribed ridicule and humiliation from the patient's fellow soldiers, believing that the patient can often be laughed out of nostalgia by his comrades or reasoned out of it by strong appeals to his manhood. Perhaps his strongest recommendation, though, to his medical colleagues faced with a regiment beleaguered by nostalgia was to find those men of battle as quickly as possible. He observed that a regiment of men from New York, afflicted by homesickness, so much so that the regiment was but a regiment in name only, was cured after fighting the Battle of Chancellorsville. Because the combat allowed the men, he felt, to fight nobly, and therefore they were men and soldiers once again. And afterwards, the regiment has since enjoyed as good a health as any in the division. Clearly, there was some confusion about the condition of nostalgia. Age, geography, and character could all bring on the condition, or not, depending upon the soldier. What is interesting, though, is the general consensus around what did not cause nostalgia. It was leaving home that caused the condition. 
It was going to war, not being in war, that caused the psychiatric suffering. Under this logic, more war was the best cure. Medical professionals made no connection between psychological trauma, war, and nostalgia. However, nostalgia did represent a recognition by soldiers and battlefield doctors that men at war were susceptible to mental breakdown in a way they wouldn't be if they had never entered the service. Nostalgia appeared once again during the Spanish-American War and the Philippine War, but this time with an important difference. In some ways, the conversation stayed the same. American military medicine had advanced little since the Civil War, and military psychiatry had advanced not at all. And again, psychiatric casualties were left to the care of untrained general surgeons. Treatment for men who broke down in battle was haphazard and largely relied on encouragement, threats of discipline, and in the worst case scenarios, the slow evacuations thousands of miles home to the United States. Also like the Civil War, nostalgia was mostly discussed by these surgeons or the soldiers themselves. Psychiatrists, yet again, paid little attention to the condition. And in the few instances where they did speak about it, they attempted to downplay its severity. The Deputy Surgeon General reported that psychiatric casualties weren't much higher than wartime than in peace. But even then, he attributed the increase to a larger force, and as he said, it was, quote, well understood to any Army medical officer that the military always attracted more mentally unsound men than any other similar number of civilians of the same age and physical development. The editors of the Journal of the American Medical Association put it more bluntly, nostalgia was not insanity. The public begged to disagree. And here's where the difference existed between the Civil War and the Spanish-American War. These are just a few of the headlines that flooded the country during what was a very short American involvement in the war. And each of these headlines was attached to a sensational article. Drawing on reports from soldiers as well as combat surgeons, journalists described American soldiers in harrowing conditions, being slowly driven insane not only because of the distance from home, but because of the heat, the conditions under which they fought, the foreignness of the enemy, and most importantly, the nature of the fighting itself. One article listed the causes of nostalgia as, quote, the isolation of the troops, their enforced confinement to the towns they garrison, and the constant nervous strain incident to continued preparation against attack by the enemy. This language did not appear in any of the earlier accounts of the Civil War. Such articles suggested that more than simply the separation from home could induce nostalgia and subsequent me mental breakdown in a soldier. The war in the Philippines marked an expansion of the definition of nostalgia. By linking the condition with debilitating insanity, newspapers stressed the severity of the disease amongst the soldiers in the Philippines. Whereas descriptions by veterans of the Civil War depicted death by nostalgia as a tragic accumulation of physical and spiritual weakness due to a longing from home, accounts from the Philippines suggested to the public that nostalgia could drive soldiers towards a dangerous mania that resulted in violence, atrocity, and death. So you might ask, why does it matter what the public thinks if the official position of military leaders and military doctors was that nostalgia wasn't a big deal? Well, because just as words matter in the naming of a mental illness, the understanding of a psychiatric disorder requires more than just a doctor or psychiatrist saying this condition exists. To put it grossly, the conduct of mental disorder is demonstrated by a deviation from normal behavior. But what is normal behavior? And who defines what is normal? Is it only the doctor? Unlike diseases like cancer or conditions like a broken arm, the symptoms and definition of a mental illness require constant debate and input not only from medical professionals, but also from patients and the public. And this is what happened during the Spanish-American War. Public interest in the psychiatric breakdown of men overseas forced the medical profession to pay attention. It also caused doctors and lay people alike to continue to think about what war could do to the psyche. Thus, only a decade before World War I, the American public and medical professionals were confronted with the unsettling notion that war could cause more than just physical wounds. But unfortunately, the Spanish-American War was too short, the psychiatric profession was too disorganized, and thus an American psychiatrist watched the war unfold in Europe in the winter of 1914. They realized that something needed to change. And change defined the mental health profession in the years just before the start of World War I. Profession here being the key word, as this was the period when the field of psychiatry advanced from being a collection of asylum directors to an organization of professionals devoted to understanding the science of the mind. Universities began to teach principles of mental health. Psychiatrists debated theories of treatment and they ventured into laboratories to try to understand the functions of the brain. Scientific advancement came in other more destructive forms as well during this time period. 
And nowhere was this more evident than in the battlefields of Europe. World War I forced these two instances of scientific project, progress into confrontation with one another. The Western Front, where much of the fighting took place, was characterized by a series of muddy trenches, where combatants were sometimes separated by no more than a few dozen yards. Soldiers engaged in trench warfare encountered artillery barrages that could last for days, snipers, barbed wire, and attacks across no man's land that tested the courage of even the most hardened individuals. The hardships of war were not limited to peril inflicted by the enemy. Men were also subjected to mud-filled trenches, exposure to the elements, diseases, and crushing boredom while the debates of military officials hundreds of miles away debated and decided the movement along the front. It was evident early in the war that the fighting would be brutal. From the outset, military doctors on both sides took on a wide array of challenges that included everything from controlling the spread of disease and implementing rules of sanitation to establishing lines of supply and evacuating casualties. Doctors confronted bodies riddled by shrapnel, missing limbs torn off by machine gun fire, and lungs burned by gas. Even the earth men dug into or piled around themselves in desperation to escape the reach of the enemy proved to be deadly. The farming fields of France and Flanders, where so much of the fighting took place, was laced with bacteria-rich manure. While no battlefield is sterile, military doctors were unprepared for the number of cases of tetanus, septicemia, and especially gas gangrene that resulted from the microblade-laden dirt working its way into wounded bodies. The medical officers were confronted by more than just physical illness and wounds. Within months of the opening battles of the war, military leaders and doctors faced a growing number of men presenting symptoms of mental distress. The symptoms varied widely, from a generalized anxiety and depression to paralysis, mutism, and even blindness. Because some of these early sufferers were also victims of severe artillery bombardments, soldiers and doctors started to label these symptoms as shell shock. As we've discussed, doctors had encountered mental breakdown in war before, but for the doctors of World War I, it felt like these breakdowns were coming at an unprecedented rate. Statistics for psychiatric casualties are notoriously difficult to calculate, and this is especially true at a time period when the understanding of mental illness was so nebulous. So it's difficult to say with any certainty whether there were in fact more psychiatric casualties during World War I than at any time previously. But what we can say with certainty is that psychiatrists were more organized during World War I, and that the psychiatric care of soldiers received provided more attention than it had at any time previously. This increased professional organization, however, did not mean that World War I psychiatrists confronted the challenges of shell shock with a unified approach. An American psychiatrist would later describe shell shock as a tabula rasa, on which different psychiatrists ascribe different causes and explanations based on their own understandings of mental illness. An example of these different opinions can be seen in the research of two prominent British psychiatrists, Charles Myers and Frederick Maud. Contemporaries and historians point to Charles Myers as the originator of the term shell shock. In October 1914, Myers found himself near the thick of the fighting in the earliest months of the war. Shortly after his arrival, he toured French hospitals where he witnessed soldiers displaying strange symptoms, mutism, and paralysis. And soon, back in his own British hospital, he encountered British soldiers with the same afflictions. Myers observed these men over the winter of 1914 and published his research in the famous British medical journal, The Lancet. Now, Myers was not the first doctor to suggest shell shock or to link traumatic injury and disorder behavior. In the last decade, psychiatrists and neurologists in the United States and Great Britain have been uh, studying the survivors of railroad accidents and finding that their behavior would now mimic what they were seeing in soldiers overseas. But Myers, or at least his research, was among the first to single out shell shock for special consideration amongst the broader concerns of military medicine during World War I. He wrote about symptoms in soldiers ranging from sleeplessness and memory loss to physical symptoms such as the loss of taste, smell, and sight. And it was this last one that interests Myers the most. He also discussed experiments in which he exposed the men to strong smells and tastes by putting drops of peppermint or carbolic acid on their tongues to study whether or not the senses could be reinvigorated by the introduction of strong smells. The results, of course, were mixed, but Myers dutifully recorded them all. In addition to testing for physical responses, Myers explored his patient's psyches as well. He applied techniques of hypnosis, hypnosis and treatment by suggestion in an effort to both uncover and treat the soldier's hallucinations and memory loss. Over the course of multiple sessions, Myers and associates used hypnosis to encourage the men to remember their war experiences. 
He tracked the recollections of the patients, and gradually he saw increases in memory restoration as well as a better quality of sleep. But despite all of his testing, Myers was stumped. And he refrained from offering any firm conclusions or recommendations. He also stopped short of categorizing the cases as either psychological or physical in nature. To Myers, the data was contradictory. He noted that Shell's explosions were loud and dusty, but mostly odorless. Yet his patients lost their sight and sense of smell while their hearing was only marginally affected. So this led him to wonder, was there a psychological component at play? Meyer's frustration and uncertainty was shared by his colleagues. And for the rest of the war, British and American psychiatrists would debate amongst themselves, was shell shock caused by physical or psychological factors? An early example of the physical explanation can be found in the research and publications of Frederick Mott. Mott gained early prominence for his pioneering research into the effects of syphilis on the brain, and he was well known for the many dissections of brains he did on poor and homeless individuals in London after they were done. He was confronted by shell shock casualties. Mott looked immediately to the brain in order to understand the condition. He argued that exposure to, phys to shelling physically altered the nervous system and produced the symptoms of some forms of shell shock. Mott believed that the central nervous system of the human body consisted within a carefully pressurized system of cerebrospinal fluid. He argued that this delicate balance was at risk, however, when exposed to the blast waves of artillery. Mott believed that the waves caused what he called aerial compression, which shocked the balance of the cerebrospinal fluid so much so that it would cease the functioning of the brain, heart, or lungs. To make matters worse, he theorized that this same aerial compression could actually shake loose the nitrogen of the blood, thereby causing air bubbles to float throughout the body much like champagne, causing instant death. The research conducted by Charles Myers and Frederick Mott early in the war is a good example of the confusion that surrounded this condition. Was shell shock caused by psychological factors, or was the result of physical injury, the shock, which the, sh so the shock by the shell, as the name suggests? Treatments for shell shock often address both the physical and the psychological symptoms of the condition. Now, if I can do this right, I want to show you a brief video taken at a British hospital. This was taken in 1917 and into 1918. These uh, three examples of shell shock patients. And the reason I want to show you this um, is for, one, it shows you the different kinds of manifestations of the symptoms of shell shock. It also gives you examples of the different kinds of treatments. I'd like you to note how sometimes these treatments were both verbal, and there's no sound. So you have to see verbal, but also physical, the way in which the doctors would grap uh, grapple with the patients and attempt to overcome their symptoms. I'd also like to point out that film was a new technology at this time period. So the utilization of this by doctors in Great Britain, this was a teaching tool that they shared with other psychiatrists around the world. And there's also an element of propaganda to this as well. Because you'll find, as they show each individual patient, not only do you see the patient at their worst, but you'll see them after they have been, quote, cured. And there's an emphasis on them returning as productive members of society. And this was a strong belief amongst British and later American psychiatrists was that shell shock could be cured and the men could be returned to being productive members. So I'll just show a brief bit of this. read the card. So this is then when they invoke sort of the physical attempts to overcome the physical symptoms. Here's, his name is Private Meek. Here's Private Meek returning to being a productive basket maker. 
actually occupational therapy like this was common. In this instance, this was actually this man's job, but many hospitals employed occupational therapy as a way to get men's both tactile movements uh, functioning again, as well as to sort of prove to them that they could produce products that they could maybe then support their families with later. And this is my favorite, because you could just imagine them saying, show them you're healthy. <laughs> <laughs> This one is interesting in that nothing is said, but a lot is conveyed. Even with no sound, you know exactly what's happening. And then this is the final example, which shows the use of hypnosis. And the tremors cease, and then they wake him up, and they immediately return. So there's actually, uh, this whole entire film is about 60 minutes long, and this is held by the Welcome Library in Great Britain. So if this is something that interests you, I encourage you um, to take a look. There's a lot of other uh, very moving examples. So by 1916 and 1917, when the Americans entered the war, most but not all mental health professionals argued that shell shock was a psychological condition. They reached this conclusion in large part because of the high number of supposed shell shock cases that had occurred amongst men who had never been exposed to shelling. In fact, there are even examples of shell shock in men who had never even made it to the front line. But again, words matter when it comes to labeling mental disorder. The name shell shock was very specific at the same time that it was also very vague. It could suggest a physical condition in an era when the stigma of mental illness was still very strong. It alluded to the unique nature of World War I with its fighting characterized by artillery bombardments, thereby eliminating any sort of universal nature to the condition. But doctors realized that it also created an inaccurate image of the illness by stressing a physical cause when they increasingly believed that shell shock was not a physical disorder. Doctors and military leaders suggested a variety of alternatives. They suggested nervousness, nervous shock, traumatic hysteria, and the one that eventually caught on with American psychiatrists, which was war neuroses. However, just because medical community, the medical community requested it doesn't mean that the new diagnostic label actually caught on. The phrase shell shock remained popular among British and American soldiers as well as the public. In fact, even general medical officers had a hard time making the switch, and often medical records contained labels such as lunatic, mental, or in Britain, the popular acronym GOK, which stood for God Only Knows. <laughs> the label shell shock remained popular in the American media as well, much to the dismay and upset of American psychiatrists. Dozen of dozens of articles mentioning the condition appeared in papers across the country, starting before the first American even stepped foot in Europe. American journalists were fascinated by the artillery shells that characterized World War I. They described the new technology that was an amazing representation of scientific achievement at the same time that it was amazingly destructive. Newspaper articles about military medicine demonstrated this tension very clearly. 
One article, the one depicted here up in the upper right hand corner, shows a cartoon image of a soldier helpless as a shell detonates in the air, showering him with shrapnel <coughs> from his head to his feet. And in case you can't read the caption, it notes with some amazement that there are 262 bullets in this particular shell, but it also noted that this made more than a dozen wounds on this soldier and smashed every bone in his body. Before long, the media was saturated with discussions of soldiers falling victims to what they thought were bizarre symptoms, which journalists helpfully linked to the destructive power of shelling. One article describes soldiers who are, quote, wounded without wounds, men who have been so dazed by the shock as to be incapable of remaining at the front. Soon, just as during the Spanish-American War, the media latched on to the phrase commonly used in the battlefield and by soldiers. Shell shock, it appeared in papers across the country. And once again, there was pushback from the American Medical Foundation. But this time, instead of denying the extent of the mental health crisis, they argued against the specific terminology being deployed by journalists. In fact, they did so much as to reach out to George Creel, the leader of the powerful Committee on Public Information, and asked him to ban the term shell shock from public media. Creel agreed, but the effectiveness of this ban was limited, and the term continued to appear in newspapers during and then immediately following the war. So it is for this reason that we remember shell shock today as the defining illness of World War I. Medical professionals hated this term and they tried to get rid of it, but history remembers it because soldiers and civilians popularized it. Words matter and labels matter for our understanding of the history of the psychological trauma of war. This is also another example of the way in which soldiers, doctors, and laypersons work together, albeit reluctantly, to create an understanding of mental illness. So now that we've discussed what shell shock is, how did American psychiatrists meet this challenge? The First World War proved to be an important moment for the mental health profession in the United States. And reflecting on the war for the American Psychiatric Association's 100 year anniversary, one psychiatrist commented, quote, the psychiatry of the fratricidal conflict of 1861 was too feeble to furnish resourceful support. And the somewhat dubiously motivated Spanish war was scarcely more than a slogan. But it was not until World War I and the terrorizing and lethal properties of machines of war for the first time approached the saturation level of human nervous resistance that American psychiatrists met the challenge of treating the soldiers who suffered as a result. As the editors of the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal Riley reminded their writers, as in preventative medicine, one of the often effective methods of averting an evil is to take an intelligent measure before meeting it. As another psychiatrist put it, it was imperative that we learned what there was to be learned from our neuropsychiatric experience of our allies. The National Committee of Mental Hygiene spearheaded this research on behalf of American psychiatrists. The National Committee was founded in New York in February 1909 with an ambitious agenda. Its members, a combination of laymen, wealthy investors, and medical professionals, sought to protect the mental health of the public. But when war broke out, Thomas Salmon was in charge of the National Committee. And through his efforts during World War I, Salmon became the father of American military psychiatry. The National Committee, and particularly Thomas Salmon, wanted a more systematic study of allied military psychiatric operations. Salmon felt the lack of preparation by the British prior to the entry of the war had led to the formidable problem they now confronted. And now was the time, he argued, for an organized military psychiatric apparatus in the United States. To this end, Salmon undertook an exploratory mission to Great Britain. Lacking government support for this mission, he petitioned the wealthy Rockefeller Foundation, which not only funded the trip, but kindly provided an additional $2,500 to Dr. Salmon's wife for the purchase of a life insurance policy in the good doctor's name. <laughs> for a few weeks, Salmon toured military hospitals in Britain and even France. He met with British military psychiatrists, including Frederick Mott. By the time he left, Salmon reached an important conclusion which he stated in the first sentence of his report to the Surgeon General. No medical military problems of the war are more striking than those growing out of the extraordinary incidence of mental and functional nervous diseases, or shell shock. Sam's report to the Surgeon General is one of the foundational documents of American military history. In it, he describes not only his views on shell shock, but he outlines the foundations for American military psychiatry. He concludes with a series of recommendations, two of which I'd like to discuss now. His first recommendation was for the effective treatment and evacuation of casualties in Europe. Salmon argued that with few exceptions, shell shock was a curable condition. And key to this cure was treatment as close to the front lines as possible. 
Salmon believed the British made two crucial mistakes in dealing with war neuroses, and the first was by evacuating all psychiatric casualties back to England. He argued that this solidified the condition in the minds of the soldier and created a chronic condition. By treating men closer to the front and keeping them in a routine of military discipline, Salmon believed that soldiers suffering from shell shock could be cured. As an aside, this process of evacuation actually wasn't unique to Sam, and the Brits had sort of started this, but actually it was the Russians who accidentally discovered it. When during the Russo-Japanese War, they needed to evacuate their patients from one end of Russia all the way back to hospitals in Moscow and St. Petersburg. And in the process, the sicker patients had to be left behind at hospitals along the way. And there was a realization that the soldiers that were being closer to the front line were actually getting better a little faster than the ones that had to be evacuated all the way back across Russia. They also came to a second sort of ancillary realization was that psychiatric officers, psychiatric casualties who were officers needed to be removed from the chain of command. And they realized this when they, the officers with the psychiatric illness began to order around enlisted orderlies, including asking them to leave them behind at, or at hospitals. They asked them to leave moving trains. They even locked them out of one train. And the enlisted soldiers couldn't do anything more than obey. And so they then learned we had to remove psychiatric casualties from the chain of command. Salmon argued for the creation of a series of hospitals dedicated to the treatment of mental illness, particularly war neuroses. And one such hospital is here. This is base hospital number 117 in France. When it started, it only had 500 beds. By the end of the war, it had increased to a capacity of almost 2,000. Inside the hospital, men were treated with discipline, and they were expected to continue acting as though they were in the military. Many men were cured within a few days. Others were sent back to the front line. Others were evacuated back to the United States. Salmon's other recommendation was for rigorous screening of all military recruits for signs of mental illness. British screening had been incredibly lax, and Salmon felt that this was the other crucial mistake, that if they had done a better job of identifying men prior to admission into the military, they would have been able to avert the numerous psychological casualties they had. And this is a key point to understanding what military psychiatrists believed caused shell shock. While they generally accepted that it was a psychological condition, they were in less agreement as to why some men broke down and why others did not. Many doctors like Salmon believed that the men who broke down in battle did so because they were predisposed. In other words, in the soldiers, the trauma didn't cause the shell shock. It merely triggered an inherent weakness that these men already possessed. To mental health professionals, screening soldiers for symptoms of psychiatric illness then served a dual purpose. It prevented men with existing mental conditions from entering the military, but it also served as a prophylaxis in the hopes that it would identify men that could possibly develop a mental health condition later on. Just as military psychiatry was new to America, however, large-scale screening and the systematic screening of recruits for psychiatric disability or the potential for psychiatric disability was new. And a lack of uniform opinion about mental illness led to confusion and contradictory terms. The Surgeon General attempted to offer guidance, but he did so in a haphazard way, suggesting that psychiatrists merely look for abnormal behavior. But again, what is abnormal? He offered a few suggestions, and I ask you to consider whether or not you would be able to identify this in a young man about to go to war. He suggested soldiers who are irritable be excluded, soldiers who are sulky, timid or overboisterous, who are suspicious, stupid, personally unclean, resentful of discipline, or if they had nicknames given to them by other soldiers, such as boob, crank, or goat. <laughs> and, and that was the extent of the guidance a certain general provided military psychiatric screeners. And the actual process of screening was even more haphazard and often occurred at the same time men were being screened for other mental conditions. So instead of a psychiatrist being able to sit down and interview a man, he often had to stand to the side while the man was being poked and prodded by other medical doctors. Psychiatrists augmented their screening efforts by reaching out to military officers and attempting to educate them on the importance of careful selection. As they explained it, this was about maintaining the fighting force of the military. One military doctor had this to say to a general officer he worked with. Just one recommendation, keep the feeble-minded at home. I know there's a difference of opinion as to whether or not there's any place for them in the army. Maybe there is, but not in France. If they are not children, all we have been sailing about childish minds and adult bodies is sentimental rot. If they are children, the hell of the trenches is no place for a child. And if anyone thinks that officers of labor battalions have time or inclination to make special allowances for the feeble-minded members of such organizations, he has not seen those organizations at work in France. 
This unnamed doctor concluded with this profound statement. If providing the fodder for the Bosch's guns will help win the war, then send them over. But it won't. What will win the war is an army of keen, alert, steel-nerved, clear-eyed American soldier boys. <coughs> Military psychiatrists' efforts at screening met with mixed success. On the one hand, men who previously would have been admitted to the military were prevented from enlisting. But the dual challenge of identifying mental illness in recruits when very few psychiatrists could even agree what mental illness looked like, at the same time of needing to convince general officers of the importance of mental examination, often proved an obstacle too hard to surmount. And as one general officer noted derisively, if the specialists do not stop in limiting the unfit, we will have no army left. The success of psychiatric screening during World War I depends on the perspective from which you view it. In the immediate post-war years, military psychiatrists such as Salmon pointed to screening as the reason that American psychiatric casualties, while still heavy, never reached the level of allied nations. Instead, screening be one of the most important lessons that military psychiatrists would take away from their experiences in the war. At the start of World War II, American military psychiatrists would institute even more rigorous screening for military recruits. But the effectiveness of screening was predicated on an early 20th, under, 20th century understanding of psychological trauma. If psychological breakdown due to trauma could only happen to those with a predisposition to mental illness, then such breakdown could be prevented by identifying or excluding those individuals. But by World War II, ideas about what caused psychological trauma were changing again. Recall my earlier comment that the words within the acronym of PTSD were debated at different points during the 20th century. If during World War I, military psychiatrists were willing to accept that trauma could lead to breakdown, but only in the predisposed, it was during World War II that psychiatrists came to recognize the role of continuous exposure to stress. From this recognition came the saying that marked the new understanding of combat trauma, that every man has their breaking point. Such an argument would have been foreign to military psychiatrists during World War I. And this again is why it's dangerous to equate shell shock and PTSD. So what lessons can we draw from the experience of American psychiatrists at the start of the 20th century? First, there's some practical considerations. In particular, effective military psychiatry during World War I sprung from a successful partnership between civilian and military organizations. The military had to learn to listen to the expertise of psychiatric professionals, while psychiatrists had to learn to shape their teachings and understandings to the needs of the military. Such partnerships are still important today. Important research into PTSD and TBI is being conducted at government and civilian hospitals. Proactive dialogue needs to continue between these two groups. <coughs> Second, military medical professionals need to be cognizant of concluding laypersons in discussions about psychological trauma. <coughs> Definitions of mental illness depend on agreement and understanding between more than just psychiatrists. As can be seen during the Spanish-American War and again during World War I, the public is intensely interested in combat trauma. An open dialogue is more helpful in educating the public than attempts at limiting the discussion to only the experts. In the wake of the Vietnam War, and especially during the Gulf War, psychiatrists and military leaders have made great efforts to inform the public about PTSD and the plight of its sufferers, and this important work needs to continue. And finally, I'll go back to my original point, that words matter when it comes to describing mental illness, and this is especially true of post-traumatic stress disorder. It is entirely possible that our understanding of the psychological trauma of war will change as medical professionals uncover more and learn about the human brain. So it is important that we not limit ourselves to diagnostic labels and instead listen carefully to the individuals who suffer from these conditions. Thank you. I welcome your questions. It, since, in your research, since World War I, mm -hmm. what research or conclusions have been drawn or advancements in identifying predisposition towards post-traumatic stress being particularly susceptible to it? Okay, well, uh, so the question was, is there still an interest in predisposition? And um, one of my sort of important caveats is that I'm not a medical professional. So I'm coming at this from the perspective of a historian. So I can say that interest in predisposition continued all the way up through World War II, which is why screening was so rigorous. But it was the realization that despite what they felt was very effective screening, that there were so many psychiatric casualties during World War II, 
there was a recognition that effective screening couldn't really do more than identify men that had existing and obvious mental conditions, so epilepsy, um, schizophrenia, diseases that would clearly exclude them from military service. There was really no way to identify a predisposition to mental illness. And I should be clear, when we speak about predisposition in World War I, this was an, an idea of heredity, so that if your father was an alcoholic, they believed that you then were likely to get shell shock, or if your mother was depressed, then you were likely to get shell shock. There was even uh, ties to ethnicity, so a belief that if you were of a certain immigrant background, then you were more likely to get shell shock. And so that was sort of the predisposition they were thinking about. It was a, a more of an attempt at predictive nature and a sort of a misunderstanding of social and cultural norms at the time. Yes? Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, have there been any historical studies done on those who were prisoner of wars during World War I and any unique psychological effects they face, especially ones who might have been tortured in any way? Not that I have seen. And really, the studies start to arise more in uh, World War II. And actually, as soon as you asked that question, the one that came to mind is Korea. And really, the psychiatric discussion that surrounds um, if, if, if each war there was a sort of discovery about psychological trauma, it was the psychological trauma inherent to POWs, especially during the Korean War, that that, was became, that that became most prominent. So I'm not aware of any research, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. But I would point you to the Korean War if you're interested in that. Yes, Randy. Uh, thanks, Rachel. Um, a quick question. What about the opposite, of course, which is a more harsh diagnosis or non-diagnosis, which mm -hmm. is cowardice? Mm -hmm. that these people are not performing because they are simply shirking. Uh, how does that balance out the, the equation of the psychiatrists no, that's, you're dealing with? That's a really great point. And this was something that, um, so during the Civil War, of course, there was a clear distinction between there were men who were mentally ill and then there were cowards. During World War I, there was some debate about this. And military leaders and psychiatrists often came down on different sides, and not always the sides you would think. So there were psychiatrists who firmly believed that sh men with shell shock were cowards. And there were over 300 individuals that were executed in Britain alone for cowardice, and many of those might have been individuals that had shell shock. However, there was certainly an argument among psychiatrists. I can think of one American psychiatrist in particular named Pierce Bailey, who argued that malingering in and of itself was its own form of mental illness. And so while that wasn't necessarily cowardice, the, it, the desire of these men to shirk from battle was an example of a mental illness that should be treated in much the same way as schizophrenia or epilepsy or shell shock. So it still held the stigma of being a shirker or a malinger, but there was a recognition that this might then itself be a form of mental illness that needed to be sort of segregated. So there was some distinction between malingering and shell shock. There were some psychiatrists who definitely saw it as the same. It really wasn't until World War II that there was a clear distinction, though I'm sure we all know the story of General Patton, that there was even at that level some disagreement about whether or not shell shock was still a form of malingering. So, so you mentioned the mass psychological screening, mm -hmm. and, and the thing that immediately came to mind was uh, the, the immigrant experience at Ellis Island. And, and I was wondering whether there was any like cross uh, pollination, uh, transfer of, uh, I guess, knowledge and expertise from like the public health service into the military service. So the question is about uh, civilian psychiatry and public health psychiatry at the start of World War One. Um, that's actually a great question, and Thomas Salmon, who I mentioned before, uh, he was brought to the National Committee on Mental Health from his position at Ellis Island. So he oversaw psychiatric examinations of immigrants at Ellis Island. And so immigration and um, the unfortunate link that this later had to eugenics uh, was this belief that mental illness could be tied to ethnicity. And so there was definitely an understanding many um, psychiatrists who sort of cut their teeth at this early sort of age of professionalization did so by looking at um, immigrant populations in an attempt to understand what mental illness looked like. So that's a good question. Yes. Um, my question just gave me a thought. Um, I know at Ellis Island and then during World War I when they were trying to screen for homosexuality, they would oftentimes look at the body and they would try and find physical characteristics mm -hmm. that might hint towards it. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you know that of any of these doctors that look towards physical characteristics on the body as evidence of shell shock. Um, so there were definitely signs of, the, the question is what physical symptoms were present, um, either as, I guess, early indicators or actual symptoms of shell shock. So they looked for physical tics, um, men that were hunched over, there was sort of the unfortunate term they used was a mongoloid kind of uh, perspective, a hunched body or different, this is shortly after the rise of phrenology, so a facial shape they thought could sort of indicate uh, an individual's 
um, intelligence and thereby their susceptibility to mental illness. Uh, but once overseas, as we saw in the video, there were a couple of things they really looked for. Uh, paralysis, the sort of a shaking gait. I can only uh, uh, compare it as a, a, a rough, uh, it's like a Frankenstein kind of walk. Uh, psychiatrists referred to this as a conversion disorder in which there was no physical reason the body should be acting this way, but the mind converted these psychological symptoms into these physiological responses. And uniquely, this is really, these happen again in World War II and Vietnam to some extent today, but they really came to define this sort of uh, presentation of, of psychiatric or psychological trauma due to war. Uh, for some reason, that became the dominant perspective of World War I. Can I answer any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes, um, outside the, the, what's shown in these videos, these clips, is there any indication for real that these wounded warriors ever returned to the battlefield as successful soldiers? So there's some debate about this. And the, so the question was, if, if some of these men were returned, did they return and were they successful? Um, the statistics on this are rare, and, and because the understanding of mental illness was so rare, and so I would sort of couch this in two ways. First, the understanding of what was an actual mental illness was so nebulous that there are instances in which men were evacuated who were perhaps just tired, and so they just needed a break. And so for these men, the chance to get away from the front lines, to have a hot meal, to sleep for a day or two, and then to be returned, for some psychiatrists, this counted as a statistic of cured. Right, this was a man who had an illness who was cured, but perhaps he really wasn't. For men that we could say had a, a, a clear or diagnostic, uh, a clear or um, recognizable psychological illness, the extent to which they were successful in returning is less clear, and I would argue uh, less likely to be true. And one um, psychiatrist made the point of saying, if, if it's not like if someone were in a car accident, we would immediately put them back into a car, but we could do that because well, there's a likelihood that they would not be in a car accident again. So we can justify it to them by saying, you won't be in a car accident again. But to say to his soldiers, we're sending him back to the front line, don't worry what happened to you before won't happen again is a misnomer. And so it was unfair to really sort of couch this in the terms of, we're healing you in order to send you back. Um, this was a huge debate during the Vietnam War about psychiatrists wondering whether or not what they were doing was actually ethical. Psychiatrists in World War I and World War II were not as concerned. They were willing to stand by the line of maintaining the fighting force of the military. Uh, psychiatrists in Vietnam were the first to really push back against that context. Yes, sir. Yeah, one more. Um, so I understand that the medical community moved away from uh, the actual physical impact of shelling mm -hmm. as the, the cause mm -hmm. of post-traumatic stress or shell shock. But at some point, you know, we did draw a link between traumatic brain injury and some yep. similar symptoms yep. of post-traumatic stress. At, at what point did the medical community sort of link those two again? So I would lark that back to probably the late 90s, early 2000s. I think up through 1980 and the immediate post-Vietnam era, there was still a belief that this was a purely psychological condition. It was really only with the rise, and again, this is, um, it goes back to the technology of the battle. Uh, World War I was characterized by these artillery shells. The, um, I'm sure you know this, the body armor that men wore going into Gulf I and especially into Gulf II was such that it protected the head and the, the trunk but could lead to a shaking in the brain that would cause this TBI. So the technology of the battle created these injuries that didn't exist to the extent that they existed during Vietnam. Did men get head injuries in Vietnam? Absolutely. But we're seeing an uptick in these injuries now and so it leads people to be more interested in what is that connection. So this is back to my larger point of that our understanding of the way the brain works changes over time. And so our understanding of mental illness needs to change over time. So if we were to say to somebody in 1980 that PTSD can also be a physical, uh, have a physical catalyst as we know it does now with TBI, they would say, well, no, that's not necessarily true. So we have to keep an open mind about how we perceive this illness going forward. It's a great question. Yes, sir. Hey, Rachel. Uh, so, a couple of comments. First, thank you for such a uh, detailed presentation today. This was awesome. Second, for the gentleman in the front row, your question might actually better be answered by looking into a human reaction to acute stress. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Grossman's book's uh, informative. Also, uh, Dr. Taylor out at UCLA did a really good study uh, in 1999 on female reaction to acute stress and the threat of life. So, that's very informative. So along that line, my question to you, Rachel, is this. So 
Uh, have you come across anything that showed or displayed historic reference to women and their reaction as far as shell shock back in that day? And I know obviously not that many on the front lines, but is there any historic no. reference? Well, one that I've come across so far um, in writing my dissertation was um, many women volunteered as nurses to go over in World War I. And this was before, um, this is the, many went over as World War, uh, as Red Cross nurses. This was before a, a clearly organized, I mean, there was, but they're not as massive as now an American military nursing presence. And so these women were often deployed to far out towns in France that came under shelling. And there's an excellent article written by a nurse who was uh, at a small town in France, and I can't think of what it was called right now, but she describes the reaction not only that she had, um, and this sort of anticipation of the shelling is what she's trying to convey to her readers, of sitting in these chateaus, hearing the bombs coming, and always wondering, are they going to come closer? Are they going to come closer? And she describes the experiences of the villagers and how they had learned to sort of live within this constant stress of knowing that these shells could come at any time, but still trying to exist within this sphere of normalcy. And so those are the few instances I've seen in World War I. It usually comes down to nurses who are willing to write these sort of small um, um, pieces of their experience. Uh, female nurses during World War II absolutely spoke about this more, especially the ones um, in Japan who found themselves as POWs, commented on the psychological trauma of that experience. And then, of course, nurses during Vietnam, many of whom were on not necessarily the front lines, but received combat as though it were on the front lines when they were bombed. Um, they had PTSD type experiences. And of course, the women soldiers of today are right up there with their male colleagues and suffering from this illness. So it does change as women's participation in the military grows. But there is some evidence that this was not only a male dominated condition as early as the 19th century. Yes, sir. Uh, you may mention about the uh, emphasis that was put on the uh, environmental conditions for the recovery um, partway through. Uh, was there any study or distinction that you saw about the sociology aspect versus the psychology aspect? I know that sometimes veterans have an easier time talking to other veterans, and so was there any kind of like study of, of soldiers together versus soldiers individually? Um, not that I've come across, but to your point, um, what made me think what I immediately thought of when you asked that question was, so if, we, if psychiatrists held this belief that shell shock was cured, right, most often cured, certainly cured once you left the war. So there was a belief that once these men returned to the United States, they should be fine. Um, many veterans, of course, realized that was not the case. And it was actually the American Legion that stepped up to be one of the first early advocates. This was before we had a very organized VA system. Didn't come about until the 1920s and 1930s. And so it was the American Legion and those soldiers that really stepped up and advocated for the soldiers on their behalf. And they were the first, I mean, we talk about like rap groups during the Vietnam when soldiers would get together and discuss these things. Um, there was a stigma against discussing mental illness that existed after the First World War. It continued to exist after the Second World War. So even if these soldiers were willing to speak about it with other soldiers, it's unlikely that they would always do it. Um, but I do think of the example of the, for, of the um, American Legion as really stepping up to sort of lead that movement. Thank you very much. Well, I always, uh,